All right, I think we're going, Davo. How do you feel about that? Blue-white breakdown, me and you, talking all things, well, not all things, well, Penn State football. We could talk a little bit about Beaver Stadium. We could talk about your, I thought you had an interesting uh, story just on on revenue and Big Ten revenue and USC and UCLA coming in and where the where the schools rank, how they're doing. No surprise, I guess, who was at the top, but what, what was most interesting to you when you kind of researched this about kind of the, the ranking of the programs? Like, would it be the fact that US, USC and UCLA don't really generate that much money or what? Bob, Bob, let's get to the important matter. Is my face lit correctly? Should less it, light it, or more it, light? You no, know, yeah. it's, 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 it's not going to get much better at this point in your life, Dave. It's not. Right, so right, right, right. Uh, the answer is yes. Sepia, uh, more tungsten. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, what I honestly I didn't get to UCLA and USC until uh, the next morning. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't occur to me to include them, and I and then I was like, "Man, what am I thinking? What yeah, am I thinking you- here? I gotta I gotta look them up." And this is revenue for the entire athletic department, or just football? No, team? just football Got and it. just gross revenue Got for it. football. Yeah. Uh, and it does not include; it's all internal revenue. It does not include the Big Ten payout. And then okay. later I did the next day I did one on uh, the SEC and that did not include the, uh, the, the, the SEC payout. We're talking about TV and streaming payout, which is yeah. massive. I mean, it, mm-hmm. the, what, what you find out when you run these lists and you run all the revenue figures is what an equalizer that TV revenue is for schools like Vanderbilt mm-hmm. and uh, Indiana and Purdue <laughs> And Mississippi State and what a lower class they are. Really, it's yeah. almost like the inequity in classes that's happening in the larger economy in America. Uh, the same thing's happening with college football. The rich are getting richer and the poor, well, relatively poor. We're talking about two of the most affluent conferences and the two most affluent conferences in the country. They're just treading water. Um, they're around 30, 40 million per year gross revenue and then the uh, the ones at the top michigan my god i was surprised me how big of i mean how they they are that far is it that big of a gap between them and ohio state yeah you saw that right yeah yeah yeah. that that did surprise you right 31 to like 110 or something like that yeah and then and then penn state right on their right right on their butts for the first time and change or something but but the striking thing is, you know, we're talking about a new Big Ten TV payout that'll be seventy around seventy million per school. Yeah, uh, that's kicking in now. Uh, these figures were from the twenty twenty one twenty two fiscal year, so they don't account for that new deal. But it, it it will start kicking in now. But you're talking about Indiana and Purdue and Rutgers and um, who am I forgetting down in the bottom? Who are, or <laughs> they're clearing, you know, like 10, 20 million a year on 40, 35, 40 mm-hmm. million gross revenue. The TV contract. Forget about is, Maryland. Maryland's pretty Maryland, low. Maryland, yeah. The TV contract is like 70 million. It's, it's by far the largest component uh, for all of those schools, uh, right? Just based on their, their, their their gross revenue their internal revenue which is not included you know the tv contract is not included in these figures so that's that's what's striking to me and then the inequity from the top to the bottom you've got michigan at did you say it was 131 i don't have the figure yeah i have it up i thought i thought it was 131 uh let me i'm just gonna scroll down real quick yeah yeah it is yeah 131.4 ohio state 109.2 penn state 107.1 yeah, and then you go down, and <laughs> and the other striking thing was UCLA at the bottom in, yeah. at forty at forty three million. That um, is surprising, I think, to a lot of people. Even below Rutgers, <laughs> and it's not surprising to anyone on the West Coast. They've been underwater financially. Wow, um, for a while they. Don't uh, have you seen any of the crowds that what they call crowds at yeah, the? Yeah, no one goes to those games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you seen those Rose Bowl shots <laughs> when they play Cal or somebody? What yeah. is Chip Kelly doing still there? Get out <laughs> well, of there. They they were eight and four, you know, know, this season that I'm talking about. And I know. 
what were they last year? I forget. You know, I think he's slowly kind of gotten them yeah. a little bit turned around. Yeah. I mean, an eight and four season in the Midwest or the East where they, they love football. Can you imagine if Rutgers was had an eight and four team? They'd they'd be filling that place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just do not value football out there at all at UCLA. We're not talking about USC. Mm-hmm. Uh, and USC has had its own financial difficulties that are more intrinsic to the athletic department where Clay Helton was signed to a ridiculous extension <laughs> by Lynn Swan a few years ago. They couldn't unload him. And the fan base, which is very, very much different than UCLA's, mm-hmm. very fervent fan base. They they love football. They just kind of rebelled and they quit showing up. So Southern Cal ranks number nine in this list among the Big Ten's uh, 16 teams, as they will be in 2024, with only 70 million. They're behind Minnesota. You know, they're 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 behind Iowa. Uh, they're behind Wisconsin. So I think that will change. They were. Uh, when I started doing these figures, 2016, I think it was, 2017, Southern California was consistently in the top 20 in gross revenue. Now they're down around 35, 40 uh, in the nation. And I think that will change now that they've got uh, a new coach over there uh, who's doing some things I think they're excited about in Lincoln Riley. So that will change, but I don't think UCLA ever will. They were always kind of a throw in, a toss in. Uh, to consolidate the Los Angeles market in this, and I don't, I, I, they just don't care about football there at all. I mean, it's it's kind of like Indiana or Purdue. It's not. It's never going to be a big sport there. Dave, one year it's going to take a little bit more work, but if you could do one on secret SEC slush funds for <laughs> football programs that aren't, they don't have to be secret anymore, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, back in the, I guess I meant like back in the day, secret slush months, on, you know, back like 10 years ago, 15 did, did years you ago. Ever, did you ever watch the 30 for 30 about SMU and the death penalty? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just a classic. Yeah. I mean, and and the, the big takeaway from that was that the entire Southwest Conference was cheating. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Were there nine of them, right, with Arkansas? I don't know, but it yeah. was it was some pretty crazy stuff. And that was in the 80s. That was in yeah. the early 80s, probably the late 70s. Who knows what it was like as we marched closer to oh, now. The, the entire Southwest Conference was cheating, but they couldn't have SEMU winning. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't the have Pony that. Express funded by uh, a consortium of probably Texas millionaires. Who knows? Including the governor. I mean, Including- the governor was involved. Yeah, hey, man, crazy, don't crazy like, story. Hey, crazy Texas, story. Texas is going to do Texas is going to Texas, Dave. I think we all know that. Well, that's, speaking of that, I mean, yeah. that's where we get into the SEC figures. I did a couple of days later. Did you see you didn't see that one? I did not. Well, Texas and hey. Oklahoma, mm-hmm. if they are seated in with the rest of the SEC programs who are not exactly poor, Mm-hmm. Uh, they are number one and number three, respectively. Uh, Texas, $161 million, <laughs> the number one in the nation. I mean, can you think of an athletic department or a football program that's done less with more than Texas? <laughs> really? And then, and, and that, that doesn't, does that not include the Longhorn Longhorn Network or whatever they have? A, that they have a, that does not include the Longhorn Network. No, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, not not that that's a huge money maker. But, I know. <laughs> uh, it's not exactly the Big Ten Network. Um, <laughs> and Oklahoma at one hundred and thirty three million. Uh, those are are sandwiched around Georgia at one fifty six, the number two. So. It's much, much different than UCLA and USC joining the Big Ten. You've got two real yeah. heavyweights joining the already filthy rich uh, as top of the SEC, the top echelon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also in the SEC, you get down in the bottom reaches, uh, Mississippi State 40, Kentucky 37. Can It looks to me, and some of these schools like Rutgers has always cooked their books so they list revenues and, and expenses as the exact same figure. 
which always indicates a shortfall. I mean, you, you, you think that's got to be a deficit and they're balancing the budget through other funds from other places in the university. That's, that's what that is. That's what Rutgers has always had to do. Kentucky did that. Kentucky did that in their last um, report. This is the, the, the um, equity and athletics data dump. Uh, mandated by the U.S. Department of Education. So these, these figures are usually all, all the same, although West Virginia did some sketchy bookkeeping that no, nobody understood, but it's West Virginia. It's a pyramid scheme at West Virginia, Dave. I think <laughs> we West all know Virginia. that. Hey, we got to get to Bob Huggins. Uh, speaking of <laughs> uh, but, but Kentucky, it appears, didn't even make a profit on football. <laughs> Which is just you know amazing. They listed 30, 37 million, 38 million in revenue. Then you got Missouri down there at 35 million and Vanderbilt at 33, who you know don't even belong in the SEC. They're a private school. Uh, so you've got this huge inequity of, of three and four and uh, even five times the gross revenue uh, comparing the top and the bottom. Dave, before we get to Bob Huggins, I wanna I wanna talk about something with you that it's near near and dear to Penn State football fans, and just generally, just your thoughts, because you know you've been around the block a little bit when it comes to Penn State football, as have I. But Beaver Stadium, a renovation when it's all said and done, it's part of a seven hundred million dollar project that's gonna get real interesting. I think after twenty 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 four season, it's gonna take a while, but. I guess, you know, rather than go into the details of it, like what what would you like to see Penn State do <laughs> to fix their stadium? You that's common, maybe, maybe common sense that I think the fan base would really like to see. I don't – I could not care less. Um, oh. I mean, we, 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 we became fans in football when you had to squeeze into seats. I mean, where did you – where did you first, first watch college football before you were a reporter? Uh, you know what? I'm trying to, well, as a Nebraska fan, there wasn't, I, I didn't go to a lot of Nebraska games, but I, I really wasn't that familiar with, you know, I, when I was at, when I would cover the express, uh, Eastern area express times, I would go to the Lehigh Lafayette games. And that, yeah. I mean, that's, those are small stadiums where you're just yeah. smushed together. Yeah. I mean, I, for, for me, like Moravian college. So it's, I'm used to small, small seats at smaller yeah. colleges, but yeah. not at a place like Penn state. That's what well, I, that they, is. they smash you in there. If you go yeah. to Michigan, that's notorious for they smash as many people together. <laughs> you got like 15 inches in your seat like this. And yeah. you're like this. I mean, yeah. it's it's ridiculous. So if, if it was up to me, I would have fewer seats, especially now where maybe maybe the interest in college football has plateaued a little. How about how about fewer seats? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess. That might be in keeping with the trend, though, and I, I don't like this, that you, you're you getting more money out of fewer people and pricing uh, the middle class out of the seats. So that wouldn't be good. But uh, maybe a little more comfort in Beaver Stadium. I hope some amenities. I hope maybe some more women's bathrooms. That would help for, for women who have notoriously had to search around. I guess it's better than it used to be. And... Of course, what we're going to see is something I may not see it, but uh, you probably will. Is, is a, a new press box because the reporters are uncomfortable. Oh no, the the reporters are too hot. They're too Honestly, <laughs> Dave, I I actually considering like where we've watched games in the Big Ten, I don't really have a big problem with Penn State. I don't. I love all. our press box. I think I we it. have it better than almost everyone. I love our press box because it's open. Yeah. You can hear the crowd. Sure, yeah. sure. Sometimes it's hot or cold in there, but who cares? Well, look at some of those other toilets we have to watch games at, and the oh. I mean the way that we're taken care of. It's not great. Well, a lot of them have been refurbished and redone, but they're sterile. That's what I take away. Yeah. I mean, even even like Purdue has been redone up in up in the uh, press box, and the 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 windows are sealed, so everything's walled off. You really can't hear the crowd. Right. Um, it's like that way. My favorite stadium in the whole place is Wisconsin, and it's probably the most old school. <laughs> yeah. Camp yeah. Randall. Because yeah. when they when they get uh, the the third quarter fourth quarter break with House of Pain going in there, yeah, uh, 
you can actually see the place and it's a hundred years old. Yeah, it's a little terrifying, but sure. There's an <laughs> adrenaline <laughs> rush in there. Yeah. Because they've got these old lamps that start doing this. Yeah. Uh, during, during jump around. Uh, I love that place and it's not, it isn't, doesn't have all the amenities and, and the, if people might not know, but do you remember when, when Paterno was mocking us for uh, saying that, it, it, you know, you, they've redone everything in the stadium, but the press box. <laughs> remember that? And yeah. he said, yeah. oh, the reporters are too hot. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He I, had- I, I think our press boxes always look kind of like a submarine. I kind of <laughs> like the look of it. I like the whole thing. I like the fact that you have to duck around some corners and yeah. I, I don't I just, mind it. I just love it because, uh, I mean, the spread's always great. They always, I, I think we're very well taken care of. I, mm-hmm. I don't think that would be a priority of mine at all. I, re, I, I don't know, understand why people. And, it, and if you don't want, if you don't want to write your article. I'll write your article before you in there. You got your free food. You're all nice and warm. <laughs> Bob Flounders sitting in there yeah. with his free food all the time. Yeah, yeah you're spoiled. You're spoiled. Um, <laughs> at Kraft, uh, Charlie Thompson did a story uh, recently about. The renovation, and uh, he he uh, quotes Pat Kraft, and in particular, point of pride for many Penn Staters, Kraft said, "Care will be taken to keep the stadium's game day capacity above a hundred thousand." Said Kraft, "We will never be under one hundred thousand. That's who we are." Oh well, great, you know. <laughs> like, you know what, Dave? I think one of the more interesting things that. Uh, they're get they're finally getting right and they're finally addressing is they're going to winterize the stadium and it's you know it's 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 obviously with a nod to hopefully the future successful maybe playoff games there but also you know I think I think there is there's it'd be quite an experience to you know have that Beaver Stadium host some things you know whether it's hockey or whatever it is uh, special events I think it would draw it's a, it's it's in a good spot geographically everything would sell out and I think. I don't know why they haven't done this sooner. Well, I think I, the main I, reason they're winterizing is they, thirty million dollar part of it. The main reason they're winterizing is they got to get ready for the college football playoff. Yeah, because but I mean, you can also host standard. some things too there as well. But yeah, they have to do it. Well, yeah, Kraft had mentioned out of nowhere to me that that um, um, the the NHL game on January first, where the Winter Classic is. That yeah, you said that's a, that's yeah. a that's an, a goal of his. Is oh, we've got a we've got a special visitor. He's back. He, <laughs> he how's the convalescence going? Oh my God, he, he's. I don't know if people know you can dogs can tear their ACLs. They call it CCL. But Kaiser, he's, yeah, Kaiser. he's 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 re- recuperating. He's about twelve days. People out. on the podcast, Kaiser's now on the on the video, and he's 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 on the way back. He's rehabbing a torn ACL. <laughs> he's he's bouncing around way more than he should. Yeah. Um, well, just keep spoiling him. That's all I would ask you do. I, I I think the Winter Classic would be great in that place. And you didn't say anything about my hat. I had to tell you what it is. I know. I know. I, I, the LA Hockey Kings fans. expansion hat. Those are great colors. I love those colors. Yeah. Hockey They're fans. Much better will, than the current ones. Hockey fans will recognize this. Older hockey um, fans will. Well, yeah, yeah. What about this? Talk about <laughs> expansion. Do you even know what that is? That, does that say Blue Jackets? Yeah, that's the original logo from 2000. Yeah. yeah. So I got a whole NHL outfit. Are you uh, watching any playoff hockey? Sure. Sure am. Sure am. It's been a, one surprise after another. I'm surprised the West is this good. I thought how the East was going to steamroll them. Well, how about Boston rolling out in game seven? I know. I know. That's the thing that I can't get past. Oh, well, the hot, that's what happens with a hot gold injury. Yeah. Look, I, you, I knew you. You should have covered hockey. You should have covered. You should have been the Hershey Bears beat writer <laughs> instead of me for two years. You would have loved it. You know, what I did is I gravitated toward Russians. And I actually got a translator to, to translate Russian for me. And then they would, they would talk like crazy. I yeah. talked to a, a, a guy from the Flyers who mm-hmm. was Russian. And I talked to one of the Bears who was Russian because you could, I mean, they couldn't even understand English. I don't remember how I came upon a translator. It was like an off day. And, and yeah. When people can understand you all of a sudden, they have all sorts of things to say. I was I remember wow. at the the Little League World Series one time, I had a talk with a South Korean reporter, and I had to translate with my phone. It was the first iPhone. I think I had a 5C, 
and but it would translate. Your flip, your flip phone wouldn't do that, Dave. <laughs> It would translate language, and I was asking him questions in English, and it would translate to Korean, and his face just brightened up. Yeah. We you so make often, because you make the effort, you know yeah, what I mean. And you make it. the effort. That's right. And so often, people we don't make the effort. We think uh, everyone else ought to speak our language, and I I, I think yeah. it's cool. Anyway, I don't I don't understand how the Russians can drink that much vodka as like their base, and and just thrive as as you know i mean it's it's that's a hard go that's a hard life to if that's your go-to drink is like what do you what do you do when you're what do you do when you're not drinking Coors Light I mean if you drink a hard liquor what is it it's not it's definitely not vodka that's uh that is I mean that is I mean I know that I know that the better the vodka the the more refined the taste but geez well what do you what uh, you know I like bourbon I like straight jack jack on the rocks nothing in it uh, but what do you drink? I don't even. I've never seen you drink any liquor. I can't remember uh, you drinking liquor. I I drink a lot of. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot of. I could say a lot of. Screwball whiskey is is my go to when I need oh, to. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's peanut butter. I'm, peanut butter is one of my favorite foods. So that's. I was always going to be that way with that. I I enjoy that. But just just drinking vodka. Woo! I mean, those. God bless the. God bless the Russian. The Russian people who subsist on that on a daily Every basis. Every time you do that, I think of Tim Curley. I know. But it, it, I mean, I know there's such a thing as a tolerance, but there's also such a thing as like just destroying your liver. So I don't know. I don't mm. know that they're making. I don't know that tolerance really comes into play there. Yes, it's it's kind of the uh, the speedball of uh, drinks. I don't. <laughs> It's for it's for hardcore people. I don't. Okay, All I don't right. that was a John Belushi reference, I think somehow, but. Mm. Hey Dave, so uh, you mentioned Bob Huggins. Uh, if you just want to, if you if you oh, really yeah. want to talk about it, we could. I don't know how many. I don't know if Penn State fans are aware of what he said, but if you want to, we got a couple minutes left. You go for it. Well, I happen to know about this talk show host. Do you remember the time that Clay Travis, before anyone knew who Clay Travis was, had James Franklin on when he was at Vanderbilt? I don't. I do not. You, you don't remember this? I do it not. Twenty twelve. Uh huh. Um, maybe that summer and he got Franklin into trouble by asking. Oh, is this the, about the recruiting? Yeah, I remember this. Dopey now, yeah. frat boy questions, you know. And and when coaches play along with it, there is no. I covered it, and I know there is no scummier industry in America <laughs> than radio. There isn't. There are no scruples. Everything is about ratings, and they will do whatever is necessary. There's a guy in Cincinnati named Bill Cunningham, who's mm-hmm. always been that guy. And now he's like 74 years old, but he's still on the radio at WLW, which used to be a great station back in the 80s. would have Bob Trumpy and, and mm. uh, Randy Michaels was running the thing. And a, guy, a guy named Gary Burbank. He was a terrific afternoon disc jockey. And they had a midday guy. And it was, it was a really well-run station with good, funny people on uh, in the last 20, 25 years, WLW has just degenerated. And this was the Reds flagship for, I think it still is for all those years with Marty Brown and Joe Nuxall. It's degenerated into this cheap ass right wing, horrible crap. And Bill Cunningham is the flagship guy. And he's still there. He tried his hand at uh, doing a Jerry Springer, God rest Jerry Springer uh, show. Uh, which was called Conflict TV. You remember, they were just about screaming and arguing and, and family conflict and just just sleazy stuff. He tried his hand at that and had that syndicated for a few years, and it didn't really take off. And now he's back in Cincinnati, and he had Bob Huggins on, and it sounded like Huggins had been drinking. I don't know. No. I know. I know. Come on. It's hard to believe. Get out of here. Asked him a during the day, then chances are I probably was. Asked him a couple of leading questions, and and are, are we allowed to say the uh, the I would word tread, on, I would tread pretty lightly, maybe just paraphrase or just. You know, I I I don't believe in not saying the word in order to just so people can understand what was said. I mm-hmm. mean, it's in the context of the conversation, and. He started talking about the Crosstown shootout, which was the, the Xavier Cincinnati basketball game, which was pretty acrimonious. Mm-hmm. And when you hear it, you can't believe it. You can't believe the stupidity of him. You know, he might say that in private and that would be wrong, too. 
And if somebody says it out loud, you know they say it in private. Yeah. But, but the very fact that he said it on the radio and all these guys are going, ha, 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 and Bill Cannon Cunningham's going, isn't he the best to his idiot right-hand man, his, his wingman. And, and, and Bill Cunningham will not be touched. Uh, he's, he's, like the, the, he's like Michael Savage or one of those guys who the, the, the more ridiculous, the, the more reprehensible the things he says, the more the station loves it because that's radio and radio, radio is scummy to its core. But I don't know if Bob Huggins is going to be fired either. Is he hasn't been fired yet, right, as we talk on Tuesday afternoon at 2. It happened, right? uh, did it, when did it happen? Did it, like, was it, it Monday? Was yesterday. Monday? It was so it happened on yeah. Monday, May yeah. the eighth. Yeah, um, I don't think anything has happened to him yet, which indicates to me maybe nothing's gonna happen to him. He'll get he'll get suspended or something. Uh, but to me, it indicates a tolerance for the that word as compared to the N word, which mm-hmm. if anyone said it, you would think he'd be gone. But this kind of slides in West Virginia. Uh, we will see. And I think that's wrong too. But, you know, people tolerate who they want to tolerate. And in West Virginia, I think you can roll with that stuff. We, we'll see. But Huggins, the thing is, Bob Huggins is not a stupid guy. He is a smart guy. I have quoted him in stories. And I actually have liked certain things about him because he's He's honest in in the way he assesses the situation and how sleazy college basketball can be. I mean, he would know, right? But his players swear by him. Uh, they love him. And Didn't he coach Danny Fortson and when, when at Cincinnati and when at Cincinnati, Fortson, yeah, yeah. Fortson yeah. punched that horse. And like, um, remember that? I don't think that was Danny Fortson. That was somebody else. That oh, was okay. that was another player. Um, I'll have to Google that. Yeah, he tried to try to do the uh, blazing saddles. Uh, who, was, who was Alex Karras's character? Mongo. Mongo. Yeah. Uh, um, there's no excuse for somebody with intelligence to to use that word. What you're just trying to do is please these these frat boy idiots on the radio. It just indicates a weakness in and wanting to be uh palsy with those sorts of people. I don't, I don't get it. But then he apologizes. How can, how can you apologize and say, I will be better at 69 years old, <laughs> either you've learned this or yeah. you haven't, you don't have any more time left to learn and be better, Bob. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. All right, Dave. Well, I think, uh, I think our time is up here on the blue white break. Hey, tell Kaiser I wish him well in his in his recovery and to stay as still as possible because the still <laughs> that's as still as he's going to get. But <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's a quick rehab and he's back got being the shaved hip. I mean, isn't I that know. horrible? Oh, I poor know. puppy. He just wants sympathy, Bob. He just wants sympathy. Yeah, well, he's earned it. He's earned it. All right, guys, we'll be back probably next week to talk about some other Penn State related stuff. And uh, we'll talk to you then. 